I should congratulate you all for coming out this evening for such a cheery topic. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, in general, death is a topic nobody wants to think about. Nobody wants to talk about. Um, and um, we try to avoid as best we can. Right? Um, I know in Chinese cultures, they've actually institutionalized it. In apartment buildings and high rises, they don't have a fourth floor. Because the word for, si, sounds like the word for death, si. So they don't want to go there. <laughs> Nobody wants to go there. No one will rent on that floor. And so they just cut it out. Sort of like we cut out the 13th floor. <laughs> so, um, and sometimes I'd be in Taiwan and I would sort of forget and think, oh, I heard that so-and-so passed away. Silence. <laughs> it's like a taboo that nobody mentions. But, um, well, in the Buddhist tradition, though, death is quite central. A topic of death is really important. In fact, it's crucial for everything that the Buddhists do. So, when the Buddha was um, searching for a path, the sight of a corpse was one of the things that really turned his mind to the spiritual path. So, I'm going to show you some slides this evening that will illustrate the point. Um, I hope you can see. Okay, is there some way to turn down the lights a little bit? And then it might show up. Oh yeah, that's good. Okay. So, um, in general, they say that in the West in particular, the topic of death has been a taboo for a long time. I remember when I was a child, no one spoke about it. When my grandmother died, the children were not allowed to go. We got the impression that there was something very dark about death, something very scary, and something that we didn't want to face, didn't want to sort of think about, um, at least until we were older. <laughs> and so, um, I think it was in the 70s, really, that death sort of came out of the closet in Western cultures with the horror of the AIDS pandemic. People had to sort of come to terms with death because it was happening everywhere. And families were affected, people were losing friends, and it was in the news really for the first time. There have always been an obituary column. But it's always on the last page, right? So death just came to the front pages, I think, relatively recently. And the, the hospice movement was the next step. Um, and you may know that the first hospice in the United States was the San Francisco Zen Hospice. So the Buddhists have been deeply involved with the hospice movement from the very beginning. So, um, you know the story of the Buddha's birth, right? And I've just collected some photos here. I like to collect photos. And the little baby Buddha, so cute. You know, every place he stepped, like a lotus would appear. So he took seven steps and seven lotuses appeared. And then... Um, as he grew older, though, he grew up in the palace, he enjoyed all the luxuries, he had all kinds of sporting equipment and, you know, great teachers, and he had a harem with 500 girlfriends, and he had everything he wanted, three palaces. But somehow he felt that something was missing, that he, he wanted to learn more about the reality of life outside the palace walls. So about the age of 29, he got his chariot, you know, chariot driver 
charioteer to drive him outside the palace walls, but very much against the wishes of his father. His father was a king and he wanted his son to become a king as well. But the young prince, Siddhartha, uh, dissipated his father. Well, there are two stories. There's one that he sneaked out without his father's knowledge. And there's a second story that his father arranged everything. That his father, he wanted to go outside the palace and see what was going on out in, outside, like in the Little Buddha film. And his father arranged everything so that he wouldn't see anyone who was sick or old or dying or anything like that. But um, he, this this um, picture uh, shows the traditional story, more common story, I think, where he went out in the chariot and uh, came upon a sick person, an old person, a corpse, or in this case, a skeleton. And then he saw a smiling renunciant, um, a holy man, right? And in India, there's so many holy men, hundreds of thousands of them, even today. Some people say a million. And so that really sort of woke him up. And he decided to give up his palace life and go out to seek the meaning of life. So that was really the pivotal experience Okay. It's not moving. <laughs> so then you probably know the story that he searched for six years to try to find the truth of life. And his he went to study with all of the great masters of his day. He learned meditation, he learned philosophy, he learned all of the ascetic practices. Um, such as fasting practices. And, um, and he practiced them well and he became very good at it. In fact, he was so precocious that many of these gurus wanted to give him their ashrams, their monasteries. But somehow he was not completely satisfied. He felt that there was still something more to learn, something more to accomplish. So here are the four sights. This is the, the common story about the Buddha seeing the four sights, sickness, old age, death, and then the smiling or serene renunciant. Hmm? So, after practicing for six years, including this extreme aestheticism, where he got down to where he was just eating one rice grain a day and drinking only one drop of water per day, then he decided that this was not getting him what he was seeking. In fact, he would gotten so emaciated, he could see his backbone from the front, and he had no energy left to practice. So he decided that he would begin to eat again. And at that point, a young woman named Sujata came along and offered him rice pudding or milk rice. They call it kheer. Very yummy, right? They boil the rice with the milk and put cardamom and sugar inside. You can try it. It's very good. Okay. And then he decided to eat. Well, now at that point, his five companions, these five aristocrats who had been following him around on his journey, they decided that he had gotten slack and they abandoned him. Mm -hmm. But he knew what he was doing. So he gained his strength back again. Here's another portrayal. Very sweet. Um, where he's accepting the rice pudding. And he gained his strength back, walked across the river, sat under a tree and de determined that he would not get up until he had reached the final goal. So... <clears throat> Under the tree, he was beset by the armies of Mara. And the arm, Mara is this scary <clears throat> guy who is like a tempter, tempter deity in Indian folklore. <clears throat> and he, first he sent his armies with, you know, spears and bows and arrows. <clears throat> sorry, and, um, you know, armies, real armies. And then he sent his seductive daughters 
All of this was to try to dissuade the Buddha from his um, goal of trying to achieve um, what he, the maximum that he could in the realm of the spirit. Okay? But they were unsuccessful in seducing him. So eventually he became a fully awakened one. Um, this means that he had overcome all of the mental defilements, all greed, hatred, ignorance, com become completely free. Mm -hmm. And then he began to teach. At the beginning he decided he wouldn't teach because no one would understand what he was talking about. It was, I mean, too much to think he was describing all of these uh, different realms of existence and the correlation between actions and rebirth, law of karma, cause and effect, and all of these very profound concepts. So he was afraid that no one would be able to understand. Finally, the gods came along and implored him to teach. They said, well, you're really on to something. You really should share this with humanity. So he was convinced and he decided to teach. Um, so what did he teach? Well, he taught the Four Noble Truths, okay? The truth about life, that life is full of all kinds of problems. It's also full of lots of happiness, but inevitably we run into problems, right? Um, all kinds of sickness, old age, death, um, getting what we don't want, not getting what we want. Uh, and so frustrations, this term suffering is really inadequate because it means something much broader. It means the idea that we, we never completely satisfied. Yeah? Second noble truth was that this kind of suffering or dukkha has a cause. And the cause is our endless cravings. Mm -hmm. We're all constantly wanting one thing after the other. So it means we're never completely satisfied. Because as soon as we get one thing, we want something else. As soon as we get that, we want something else. We can see it very clearly in the society around us, eh? It's never ending. And this desire is rooted in a basic ignorance. Ignorance of the concept. That craving only leads to more desires, more craving. And human desires are endless. Hmm? Then he taught the third noble truth, which is the cessation of suffering, cessation of dukkha and dissatisfaction, which he called nirvana. Okay, the, the, this cycle of endless cravings can come to an end. And fourth, he taught the path to ending this dukkha, this suffering, these problems. And he called this the Noble Eightfold Path. So here's the Noble Eightfold Path. Okay? All right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right effort, right livelihood, right mindfulness, right concentration. So, in other words, we got to do everything right. <laughs> yeah. So, that's the idea. Hmm? Because um, wholesome actions lead to pleasant results. Unwholesome actions lead to unpleasant results. It's a really simple formula, but it takes people a while to like get it. Um, but that's the basic law of cause and effect. Okay, he also taught the six perfections. Hmm? Sometimes six, sometimes ten. But um, in the formulation of six perfections, it's generosity, ethical conduct, patience, joyful effort, concentration, and wisdom. So you'll see that sometimes certain principles show up in more than one list. So, you know, the Buddhist teachings uh, were given over a period of 45 years. So the Buddha was wandering, he was a homeless wanderer all over northern India, teaching all kinds of people from all different kinds of backgrounds. So he would come up with different ways of presenting the material. So it shouldn't surprise us that sometimes things like ethical conduct or concentration <coughs> Uh, will show up in more than one list. In fact, that's kind of, that's good because it sort of reinforces uh, these ideas. So um, he also taught the divine abodes, what they call the four Brahma Viharas, right? So the first one, loving kindness, 
uh, wishing all beings to be happy. Compassion, wishing all beings to be free from suffering. And he taught sympathetic joy. That means rejoicing in the virtues and good deeds of others. So that's a perfect antidote to jealousy, right? Yeah. And the fourth one, equanimity. Equanimity. We get addicted to these, the rush and then we dive into a kind of depression. And then we go for the next rush and then depression. Up and down, up and down. Emotional merry-go-round, right? And nobody's doing it to us. We do it to ourselves, right? So equanimity is to start balancing that out so that we can be completely content in the moment, moment to moment, without having to reach for these highs and sink into these lows. Just like chill. Huh? Okay. And then the Buddha died. Okay, so they often call this the sleeping Buddha. But he's not sleeping. He's, he's dying. Mm -hmm. And this was the Buddha's final teaching. Perhaps one of his most important teachings. Because we live in illusion, right? We think we're going to live forever. And we live as if we were going to live forever. You know, taking out mortgages and, you know, buying cars on, on time payments and, you know, all the silly things we do, right? But we don't know how long we're going to be here, right? So that was the Buddha's important teaching. And he modeled that by dying himself. So the Buddha wasn't a god. He never pretended to be god. He wasn't interested in being a god. Because the gods are also stuck in the wheel of rebirth. Ah, we'll get to that. So he modeled death and impermanence by dying himself. And that's a really good lesson for us. I like to collect these images of the dying Buddhas. So this one's from Sri Lanka. This one's from Cambodia. This one's from Laos. This one's from China. This one's from Japan. This one's from Nepal. This one's from Indonesia. This one's from India. Now, they asked the Buddha what they should do after he passed away. And he said, cremate my body and take the relics in the ten directions. Okay, some texts say four directions, some say ten directions. Okay, so, and then place them in a kind of reliquary, they call it a stupa, and this would become an object of reverence for people, where they could pay respect to one who had achieved the final goal, the final goal being perfect awakening. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of a stupa, an ancient, ancient stupa, maybe even dating from around the time of the Buddha, we don't know. It was just discovered a couple of years ago in Bodh Gaya, which is the place where the Buddha achieved perfect awakening. And we always knew that there were these little hillocks in around the landscape, but nobody knew what they were. Finally, the Indian Archaeological Society started to dig, and they found these, these stupa. It's very ancient. And there's generally nothing inside of them, though in some countries, sometimes they'll put, like in Tibet or Bhutan, they'll put precious things inside. But the ones in India originally would have just some relics of a, a saint or a Buddha. Uh, and then they would build a brick sort of reliquary around it. So I also collect images of these stupas in different countries. This is Cambodia. It's right on the King's Palace grounds. 
This is from China, southern China. This is from northern China. This is Shaolin Monastery. You know Shaolin Monastery? Yeah, they have a whole forest of stupas there. It's amazing. One of my favorite graveyards. This is um, along the Himalayan border between India and Tibet. This is Vietnam. This is Tibet. This is Nepal. It's Mongolia. And this is a Japanese stupa, a smaller one, uh, made of, of bronze. And it's actually in a temple in Calcutta, India. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so now this scary fella is called Yama. Yama, the Lord of Death. Yama is wait, waiting to pounce on us, right? At any moment, <laughs> we don't know. It's sort of like, um, you know, Carlos Castaneda? Yeah, he, he said that the, um, his teacher, his mentor, taught him that death is always at our left shoulder. Remember that? Yeah, so that's the same concept. Mm -hmm. that Yama is just waiting. The only thing that separates us from the next life is one breath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in his teeth, Yama holds the wheel of life. The wheel of life illustrates our possibilities for the future. Okay. Now some people in you know secular society believe that we just die and that's it. The end. Uh, I'm teaching a course in death and afterlife up at USD this semester. And when I went around the room, it's a Catholic university, right? So about 50% were raised in Catholic families. When I went around the room, about one third of them said, what happens to us after death? The end. Oh, very interesting, yeah? So it, um, in fact, there's a change, a generational change in attitudes towards death and afterlife. But in the traditional Buddhist view, after we die, unless we get liberated or enlightened, then we will have to take rebirth. And depending on our actions, that means actions, karma means actions, right? So originally there were five possibilities. We could be reborn as a god. We could be reborn as a human being. We could be reborn as an animal. We could be reborn as a hungry ghost. Or we could be reborn as a hell being. Okay. So here it actually shows the five realms, the original five realms. Later the God realm got divided into two. Um, the long life gods who live for a very long time, 80, 100,000 years. Uh, and then the demigods, the asuras. They are like the Greek jealous fighting gods. They're like us, but they're more powerful. They're always getting into mischief. Uh, trying to assert their power and control others and all that sort of silly stuff. So now we speak of the six realms of rebirth. Though originally we spoke of five. Now of these realms of re possible rebirth, we only generally have access to two. The human realm and the animal realm. Some people see ghosts. In fact, in my class we talked last week, we talked about ghosts apparitions, uh, poltergeists, and all these kinds of phenomena. Um, is it simply coincidence that almost every human culture in the world has such a thing as ghosts, and heavens, and hells, 
is that just happenstance or maybe there's something to it in any case so some people see ghosts but not all generally speaking in the buddhist view you'd have to be very highly attained to be able to see into these other worlds so how do we know that they exist well according to the buddhists we rely on the evidence of highly realized beings um, even from the very early texts we find mention of this ability these supernormal abilities to be able to see into one's past lives to be able to see the past lives of others it's not that difficult actually um, it should be done under the guidance of a highly qualified teacher but if you think about our mental continuum being sort of one stream of consciousness then it makes sense that we would be able to track back to our you know early life our childhood our babyhood the moment of conception and then from there it's just a small leap to the last moment of our previous lifetime right so that's what the buddha did when he was sitting under the tree he saw his past lives and that's how he verified that this is the human experience to be vulnerable to repeated rebirth again and again and again and again but not always as a human being as you know, American spiritualists used to teach that once you achieve a human rebirth, then you don't, you don't devolve into any lower form of rebirth. In fact, this is the first question I ever asked the Dalai Lama. <laughs> oh, yes, 1972. So he used to meet with us because we, he said we came from such a long way away that, um, to learn about Buddhism. And he always made time to, to meet us and our parents and so forth. So I ask him, you know, in the Western spiritualist tradition, they say that once you achieve a human rebirth, you, you never devolve to a lower form of rebirth. He's, his answer, you can be reborn as anything, anytime. So, um, so that's the possibility. Those are the possibilities. Now, oh, well, that's blank, isn't it? Okay, let's go back to, if you look in the middle of the picture, you'll see the snake and the pig and the rooster. So these are called the three poisonous delusions. And they're the greed, hatred, and ignorance. So greed is represented by the rooster. Hatred is represented by the snake. And ignorance is represented by the pig. But actually now we know that pigs are actually quite smart. <laughs> But I guess they didn't know that back in those days. So, And then the realms of rebirth on the right are the unhappy migrations. They call it unpleasant migration. The ones on the left are the pleasant migrations. So, And the outer ring are the 12 links of dependent arising that explain how we got into this mess in the first place. And they track it back to ignorance, beginningless ignorance. So, the basic ignorance is that we don't understand our situation. We're clueless about how, what we're doing here, where we got, came from, where we go after death. That's ignorance, really. So, because of ignorance, then, it sets up a whole chain of events, consciousness and contact with different things, craving, grasping leads us into rebirth then that inevitably leads to old age and death and the whole thing spins around again and again and again and again tape number nine number nine number nine so how do we get out of it so that's what the buddha was concerned about he said whether there's a god or there's not a god really doesn't change our situation we're in a big mess here and we better pay attention and try to get out of this mess so I know this is probably comes kind of, as a rather of a shock, but I'm going to just tell it like it is in the tradition, right? The, now in contemporary American Buddhism, it's all sweetness and light and you know dealing with your inner demons and all this sort of thing. But I'm, I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to put uh, lay out the 
the Buddhist teaching as as he did and as I learned it from my teachers. Okay, I don't know, maybe we're supposed to realize emptiness. <laughs> <laughs> so we can meditate on emptiness, but... Um, oh, okay, so here's the center of the picture. You can see more clearly the undesirable realms of rebirth and the more desirable realms of rebirth. And we can choose for ourselves where we want to go. I mean, basically it's up to us because in this, uh, this um, worldview, there's no one controlling the picture. No one in charge of the movie. We're in charge of the movie. Right? We're responsible for our actions and therefore we're responsible for the consequences. We can't blame it on God or anybody else. Right? It's, it's basically up to us. So the practices around death vary from <coughs> culture to culture. And in the Buddhist cultures too, we find many variations. So I also like to learn about the death rituals in different Buddhist countries. Um, full disclosure, actually, um, when I was a kid, as I mentioned, I didn't have much contact with, with death, but two of my dogs died. And that was really a um, serious blow for me because humans, I couldn't understand at all, but dogs, I was really into dogs. Yeah, I'm still into dogs. <laughs> And both of my two dear doggies died. And that was really, I think, the worst suffering I'd ever experienced. So it, the, the question of what happens to us after our, we die had always intrigued me since I was a kid. And I would ask everyone that I thought might have an answer to this question, all the ministers, I think I drove them a little bit crazy, you know, what happens to us after we die? But they said, well, if you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. And that concerned me because I was really naughty. yeah. So I was kind of worried about that answer. And also it seemed a bit simplistic. Only two choices? Because Protestants don't have purgatory. No second chance, yeah? Pass, fail. <laughs> right? So... <coughs> So I always kept this question in mind, and it wasn't until I got to India and started studying with the Dalai Lama, the teachers that he used to appoint for us, that I started to get some answers. I remember vividly at an East West Center grant, you know, to learn Tibetan and study uh, Tibetan Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy. So I was in Dharamsala in northern India, where the Dalai Lama lives. And my, I'd been mucking around in Bali, you know, so I had to begin my grant on July 1st. So I was running down the mountain on July 1st, you know, and I had to start my classes that day. And I burst into the classroom, um, and there was this little llama at the end of the room, sitting on a cushion with a yellow hat on. And he was saying, at the second stage after death, you will see a faint smoke. And he was telling, teaching exactly what happens to us after we die. I mean, exactly. So they describe the dissolution of the physical elements, you know, the earth, water, fire, air, ether. They describe the dissolution of the aggregates. We'll get to that in a moment, I think. Uh, if not, we'll come back to it, right? The body, feelings, the dispositions, the, you know, karmic formations, and then the, I'm sorry, the discriminations, and then the dispositions, and then consciousness, right? One by one, these dissolve all the elements of our personhood. And there are certain signs that we see at each stage. And we, if we have meditated properly, then we'll be prepared for all of this. And we, as they dissolve, we can see, you know, affirmation, confirmation of all that we've been doing. And we can maintain calm. Um, and then we can, you know, go calmly into the next rebirth. If we've practiced well and become a bodhisattva, we may be able to even choose our next rebirth. But that takes quite a lot of training. I mean, serious training, right? And 
if we don't have that kind of preparation, on the other hand, then when we come to the end, it can be quite scary. First of all, we're leaving everything behind. We're leaving behind our friends, our family, all of our possessions, all those things we've been collecting, our bank accounts, our, our titles, all of our accomplishments, even our, our mind. Right? It's all going to transform. And so that can be a very scary thing. We'll also have to face all of the actions that we've done in our lives, like the sort of life review that some people have experienced, uh, near-death experiences report, the life review. I remember one time, I had another close call. I've had quite a lot of close calls. <laughs> yes. Um, one was when I was a kid and growing up in Malibu. And it was the, f we were about 11 and 12 maybe, my brother and I. It was the year before we got surfboards. We were not surfing. And it was during a storm warning but we didn't know that so we started out on our mats and the waves started getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and we were really strong swimmers but we lost our mats on about the second wave and we just kept swimming out now we're just little buggers yeah but swimming out again and every wave was bigger than the last so we can make it through one and here comes another one but swimming and then dive under that one and here comes another one before we know it, we were three quarters of a mile offshore, Latico Canyon, right? And we were out there for a few hours before we were finally picked up by uh, the Coast Guard. A fishing boat came by and just waved at us. Two kids, three quarters of a mile offshore. Anyway, so um, someone had seen us and called the Coast Guard, or called my, my mother totally freaked out and then they came and got us we we're all blue and everything so so we never know when death might come and during that experience my brother and I we, we thought about swimming you know south to Malibu but there were lots of rocks between here and there or swimming against the current would have been even harder so we'd actually even like made our peace <laughs> And we had that experience of a life review. So I, kn I, I know what that feels like. Um, so in any case, uh, different ways of dealing with the dead. Here in Laos, they'll build a sort of temporary stupa-like thing. Now this is a wealthy family. The, the uh, deceased, whose photo you see there, uh, was rather well-to-do. He worked for an international uh, non-profit organization. Um, unfortunately, he died in an unseemly way. He died of a in a, in a brothel of an overdose of Viagra, and that was quite embarrassing. But my friend happened to work for him, so I got to attend the funeral. So they put the the remains in the temporary stupa. And then they placed it on a truck bed and took it down to the temple down at the end of the street. And the male relatives in Lao culture, as in Cambodia and Thailand, will become sort of a monk for a day, a temporary monk, to accumulate merit to dedicate to their loved one. So that's the son sitting there with the photo and then all the cousins and uncles and all, all of them will become a temporary monk. And then uh, we all went down in procession behind the, the corpse uh, to the temple grounds. And then they light a kind of a, a fuse, a rocket, yeah, a rocket. And after doing some chanting and so forth, and then the whole thing goes up in flames and it's cremation. Now here's another example from Taiwan, the funeral of a nun, and she was very well respected and well loved. So they invite uh, monks and nuns to chant. 
and you can sort of see the gender dynamics here, right? The monks in the front row and the nuns way in back. And the, the lay relatives, the lay people will also join in if they know the chants. And uh, those were her relatives, yeah. And um, they will, in many cultures, will memorialize the dead, particularly in Chinese culture and Vietnamese culture. They'll actually place a photo of the deceased in special sorts of shrines in the temples. Now this happened to be a nun's temple and they had a whole shrine for deceased monks and then they also had one for deceased nuns. I've also seen them in say Penang and um, Indonesia where they have the ashes in the urns with the photo on the urn and then sometimes little favorite things that you know like their favorite chocolate bar or something like that sometimes even cigarettes or something something that the person was fond of. Have you seen that, Li mm -hmm. Yeah. In Japan and Korea, they tend to put the name on a, on a plaque, a placard. Okay, so now knowing that we're going to face this, all of us are going to face this sooner or later, we hope later, but how do we prepare? Well, we can do many different kinds of meditations on death and impermanence. And the Buddha taught many, many different meditations. Uh, one basic one is to sit and notice how all everything in your body is changing all the time. And we don't normally notice because we're consciously distracting ourselves with all kinds of things outside. But if we sit quietly, we can notice that our body and our mind are constantly changing. Every cell, every molecule. And they're arising and perishing, arising and perishing, moment to moment. In fact, we could say that we've been dying from the time we were born. Right? Because we're not the same person who walked in the door a half hour, hour ago, right? All the molecules, everything in our body has completely changed. And we know that our mind has changed as well, right? Now, that's one meditation that they do just to get to start paying attention to the fact that our, our mind and body are changing all the time. In fact, we're decomposing all the time. We're in a constant state of decomposition since the time we were born. That's why we have to bathe, right? If we don't bathe for a while, oops, right? <laughs> so that's clear evidence. You know, here's another very popular meditation. Um, we meditate on three points. First, that death is definite. Second, that the time of death is indefinite. And third, at the time of death, nothing will be of any help at all except our spiritual practice. The Buddhists say Dharma practice, right? So they take this very seriously. Okay, death is definite. And they'll run through in meditation. Um, all of the famous people throughout history and see whether any of them are still around. You know, starting from ancient history, start with Lao Tzu and Confucius and, you know, the Buddha and Jesus Christ. We can bring it up, you know, the Prophet Muhammad. Then we come up to recent history, you know, with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Mother Teresa and you know John F. Kennedy and all these famous people. Where are they now? Can we think of even one person who has managed to avoid death? Can't find one. Hmm? Okay, the second one is the time of death is indefinite. Okay, so we all wish to live a long and happy life hmm? and die. Uh, naturally in our sleep, hopefully. Well, I don't know, when we were kids, we always wanted to die surfing. <laughs> but of course, that was foolish, right? Die surfing, yeah, it sounds really romantic, but when you think about it, glug, 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 I mean, it's not a happy experience, right? So, um, but there's no assurance of how we're going to die or when. Um, the average lifespan 
these days in the States is something like 82 for women, 81 for men. In a place like India, it's 52. In a place like Nepal, it's 36. Mm -hmm. One quarter of the, of the children don't make it past four. Mostly from waterborne diseases, completely preventable. Yeah? So, um, some beings don't even make it out of the womb, right? Stillbirth and so forth. So, um, so life, the time of death is, is truly indefinite. Uh, we could get hit by a truck on the way home. I mean, I hope it doesn't happen, but you know, it could happen. The way people drive here, oh my gosh. So, and the third point, at the time of death, only our spiritual practice will be of any use at all. So, no matter how much money we might have in the bank, you cannot buy off the Lord of death, I say. Um, no matter how many friends and family we have, how much, no matter how much they love us, they really cannot hold us back from death. In fact, friends and family can even become an obstacle because we're attached to them. And that might prevent us from going smoothly to the next life. Right? Um, and our accomplishments and all of those things I mentioned. And I, I could mention the example of my own father who was extremely wealthy and he was highly accomplished. He had many, oh, he had so many um, degrees and um, certificates. And, you know, he had, you know, he was a pilot. He was a pilot instructor. He was a helicopter pilot, helicopter instructor. He was, um, oh, he had so many things on his wall. Wall was covered with all this stuff. <laughs> and, and yet, Toward the end, he even said to me, I, I think I've wasted my life. In a weak moment, he said. Because, you know, his goal was just to collect piles of money. That was his whole intention. And he thought the rest of, of us should too. <laughs> and he was really upset when, you know, I became a nun and all of that and just threw it up. But so. But our spiritual practice, some of these meditations, can be very, very helpful. Okay? So they talk about mindful living, mindful dying. Uh, the same thing that's going to help us die well are the same things that are going to help us live well, actually. Mm -hmm. So here's some examples. Mindfulness of breathing. Mindfulness of breathing is the most simple practice, and yet it can be the most helpful when I was um, about 25 years ago, I was bitten by a poisonous snake in Dharamsal. And um, it was really serious. Nobody knew what to do. The problem was that I hadn't seen the snake. So I didn't know why I was getting so sick. But the Tibetan doctor found the bite. And he said, I, you've been bitten by something. And he ran off to get me some Tibetan medicine. Tibetans have really good medicine for poisons. It seems to be the uh, method of choice if you're going to off somebody. So they have really good, uh, yeah, they have really good antidotes to poison. So he, he ran off and got, came back with a glass of water and told me to take it immediately. And then I passed out and Eight days later, nobody knew what to do because they'd gotten gangrene. So some of them were going around uh, Dharamsala saying prayers at all the different monasteries. Some of them were looking for, you know, medical options. Finally, some fr a friend of mine who was a bit psychic uh, saw that I would die if I didn't get really good medical treatment immediately. So she and her husband drove me to Delhi, to a hospital in Delhi. It was a time during um, this Khalistani separatist movement in India when there was fighting uh, between the Sikhs and the Hindus. So it was horrible, right? They would uh, stop buses on the road and pull everybody off and shoot everybody of the other religion. 
it was it was bad. So we weren't allowed to drive during the night to the Punjab. We had to leave at midnight and arrive at the border of the Punjab uh, by daybreak, and only then we could go to get to Delhi. And we arrived, and that put us in Delhi in the middle of the heat of the day, with all the traffic jumps and everything. And they took me to this hospital, which was a disaster. Um, where they just left me, I was totally in shock. And they just left me lying, you know, in the wheelchair. And no medical attention at all. So finally my friend freaked out, called the American Embassy, and they said, uh, take, take me to East West Medical Center, which was the best hospital at the time in Delhi. Um, she later, the, the doctors in the hospital, recommended that she bring a case against the hospital, which she did, and it was later shut down. But that didn't help me at the time. So they got me to East West Medical Center, and they were prepared to amputate my arm, because by that time it was like a big, you know, like saran wrap, totally black and totally infected. Now, in the olden days in the Southwest, if you got bitten by a rattlesnake, they would do a fasciotomy. That means they they cut the arm and let the pressure out. That's what gangrene is. It's the building up of the pressure which kills the cells. And when they die, then they get infected and then they infect your whole body and you die. So they were going to amputate my arm, but they were afraid I would die and they didn't want to be responsible for it. So they just left me lying there for eight days. But I'm a tough little bugger, so somehow I survived. And after that, you know, many, many surgeries because they have to get rid of all the rotten meat. Yeah, so after all that, my arm was just like hamburger on a stick. And nobody knows how I survived. It's some kind of miracle. And then they had to start doing skin grafting to put some, some skin, take every 10 days, they take the skin from my legs and put it on the arms. So this is a reconstructed arm. Very nice arm. Yes. Um, so that's one of my near brushes with them. So while I was in the hospital, I found this meditation on breathing really, really helpful. Because even though I had been meditating for 30 years or more at that point, I never banked on having to meditate with such pain, intense pain. I also hadn't figured that I would be taking drugs. Because in the hospital, they give you all kinds of drugs, right? I didn't even know what I was taking. After I came to, uh, after a while, you know, they just come by with a big handful of pills. and You just eat the whole handful of pills. So finally I said, what's, what's in there? And they said, oh, nothing, you know, it's just Valium. I said, what? Valium is bad for your mind. <laughs> so I said, I don't want to take that anymore. But until then, you just feel so groggy. It's very hard to concentrate. So I, one thing I realized from that experience is that I really needed to learn to meditate better, more. Um, that I, I mean, seriously in order to be prepared for whatever circumstance we may meet at the time, at the end, you see? So meditation on breathing, very simple, very practical. Second one is meditation on loving kindness, okay? So I realized that no matter how serious my situation was, I was in the hospital, the best hospital in Delhi at the time. And that was due to the kindness of my mother who lent me the money for the, to pay the bill. Otherwise, they throw you on the street, yeah? So, it happened to a friend of mine, actually. Um, and so, this meditation on loving kindness was really good because it helped me get over my own, you know, poor me kind of thing. To think that there were others who were in a much worse situation than I was. And to send loving kindness, because when we send loving kindness, of course, it rebounds on us. It makes our hearts more loving, more kind. So that's a really good thing. The third one, meditation on the stages of the dying. 
that's what I mentioned, actually meditating on the stages of the dying process. So we become familiar with what we're going to go through when we face death. If we know what we're in for, then it's easy. Oh, yeah, okay, faint smoke. I get it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. And you know exactly what to expect. Um, the next one is chanting sacred texts and mantras. So even if we get a terminal diagnosis, well, that's really lucky because then we know how to prepare for the end. We can use our time wisely and create merit for our future rebirth. So the Buddhists will recite texts. doesn't matter what language we recite them in. But we can chant texts and we can repeat mantras like Om Mani Padme Hum and, or in the Chinese tradition the name of Amitabha Buddha or whatever. If, if we're Christian we can recite the Hail Mary or you know the Jesus Prayer or whatever feels comfortable. And that can be a nice way of, well for one thing it gets your mind off your misery, right? <laughs> so it's, it's a good thing. Um, Next is, in the Tibetan tradition, they have a practice which they call the transfer of consciousness, poa, poa. So again, we need to learn the practice and practice it well in advance of dying. In the practice of poa, what they do is to meditate on the 72,000 winds and channels of the body and learn to collect all of them into the right left and central psychic channels and then bring the winds up to the top of the head uh, but just hold it there right for now and then at the time of death we eject them to the pure land now pure land is a pure space where a buddha is teaching uh, it's a place where there are no problems, you don't have to work, nobody's fighting, there are no distractions. And it's very easy to achieve enlightenment from a pure land. Right? So in order to get to a pure land, we have to become a bodhisattva, or at least we have to have lots of clear faith, uh, and then pray to be reborn in a particular pure land. So in, in the Tibetan tradition, it's very unique that they actually train in collecting the winds and channels and guiding them up to the top of the crown of the head. But of course you don't want to eject it prematurely, right? Because you don't want to go to the pure land yet, right? You want to wait until you're ready to die, right? Okay, now in the Chinese tradition they also talk about the pure lands, um, especially the pure land of Amitabha Buddha. And they say that if you chant the name of Amitabha Buddha, then at the time of death, Amitabha Buddha will help you to get to his pure land. So that's why you'll see if you go down to the Japanese temple on Market Street, you'll hear them saying, Namo Amitabha Buddha. So they say it in Japanese. Or the Chinese temple on Park Boulevard, Namo Amitabha Right? And they chant it very beautifully. They sing it, right? Namo Amitabha Namo mi to fo, 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 namo mi to fo. They'll go on for hours and sometimes for days chanting like this. And then they'll get up and they'll walk around the benches like this, sometimes in hundreds or thousands of people mm, chanting this mantra. You really think you've died and gone to a pure land. <laughs> so it's a beautiful practice, right? Um, in Taiwan, for example, they have in the monasteries a pure land halls. So it's like an old folk center where the people will take their parents, they'll drop them off before they go to work, and the old folks will stay in the temple all day and they'll do the chanting of Amitabha. Sometimes they'll watch television and then they get, you know, vegetarian lunch and then they'll chant some more and then the kids will come and pick them up in the evening. So it's very common. Hundreds of temples have these um, 
Amitabha halls where the people can practice. Uh, yes. Is Amitabha the, the name of the original Siddhartha Buddha? Or is that the no, it's another Buddha. The Amitabha Buddha is another one. Siddhartha or uh, Shakyamuni Buddha is the Buddha of our historical era. The one who got born in you know, about 5th century BCE. And the story that I just told is of this particular <coughs> Buddha. Amitabha Buddha is another one who made 48 vows. And one of the vows was uh, not to be reborn as a woman. <laughs> That's cute. Um, and then <laughs> one of them was that anyone who... <laughs> Yeah, anyone who calls his name, he will make sure that they take rebirth in his pyramid, Sukhavati pyramid. <coughs> so, yeah. So that's why they do this practice. And they, they will recite the name just nonstop, every day. Uh, when this practice went to Japan, they also started by chanting the, the name of Amitabha Buddha again and again and again. And then Shinran came along and said, oh, but if you chant it with, with great faith, you only have to chant it once and you go to the pyramid. So that became the most popular tradition. <laughs> and it's still the most popular Buddhist tradition in Japan and in the United States. 250,000 members in the Jodo Shinshu Temple. So, uh, so... Yeah, so there you have it. Okay, so many more practices, but that will give you an idea. Now, there's also the phenomenon of what in Chinese they call the flesh bodhisattva. Um, flesh bodhisattva is one who does not decompose at death. Um, I'm not sure that the Buddhists are the only ones who have this. I think some of the Christian saints also were able to, um, yeah, not decompose. Now, how do you know when someone's consciousness has left the body? See, in the, in the Buddhist tradition, in many, especially the Tibetans, talk about not disturbing the body of the dying person. Let the person go through their process without, like, you know, moving them around, without, uh, you know, sobbing, without fighting over the estate. <laughs> yeah. And if we cannot control our grief, it's better to go into another room, into the next room, where we don't disturb the dying person. Because that would help, that would arouse, you know, attachments, which could be problematic to the dying. Um, interestingly, in many countries, and including the state of California, there is um, a statute on the books that allows uh, a dead body to lie in state for up to three days. So the Buddhists would say, well, maybe it's a good idea to allow the, the being, the body, to rest in state up to three days uh, in case the consciousness is still in or around the body. Okay. Uh, we wouldn't want to dispose of them prematurely, so to speak. Now, how do we know when the consciousness has left the body? Well, in the Tibetan tradition, they'll go and ask for a divination. But the sure way to know is when the body begins to smell. When the body begins to decompose, we know that the consciousness has left. And the being has, has gone on to a future rebirth. Hmm? Or... Perhaps an intermediate state. Now, the Tibetans talk about an intermediate state between death and rebirth. And this is also commonly accepted in China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and so forth. But in some cases, the body doesn't decompose. There are three such cases in Taiwan. There are quite a few in China as well. So I've seen all the ones in Taiwan and one in, in China, mainland China. Now, this the story here was that um, a, this man was a lay person, had a wife and, and children, and then became a monk later in life. Okay? So he had a small temple outside of Taipei. And when he died, they buried him in the graveyard right next to the temple. Some years later, his daughter was sweeping the graveyard. She accidentally broke open the, the um, coffin of her, of her father. And there was her father just sitting there, meditating. Well, 
So she immediately called her teacher, a famous nun who was also my teacher, and we went to, the, to pay respect to her father, who was now, you could see he was just recently plastered. They put plaster on the face and then gradually they put gold on the face. And my teacher offered these clothes because the Chinese are kind of prudish, yeah? So they want to make sure the body is, is properly dressed. And then eventually they got something more, you know, fancier. And he becomes an object of respect because he obviously was something very special. Uh, no doubt a bodhisattva, one who's uh, achieved the state of, of a bodhisattva, one who's striving for perfect Buddhahood. And, um, yeah. So, now here's another case. This is from the borderlands between India and Tibet. Uh, in a small village, just about three kilometers from the Tibetan border. There was a stupa there in the village, and around 1930, an earthquake occurred. And when the army came in to help the villagers uh, after the earthquake, uh, for some reason, one of the officers struck open the, the stupa, and inside they found a meditator, the body of a meditator, uh, who was sitting there, um, sitting there with his, his hands around his knees with his prayer beads in his hand. Now, once the air hit the body, then it started to shrivel up a bit. But you can see that the hair is as if it were still growing. Mm -hmm. So again, now the, they plastered up, they remodeled the, the stupa, and it's still there today. Now here's another case. This is um, Venerable Tikkwantu, who was, um, who famously immolated himself in an intersection in Saigon in 1963. I think everyone knows the story. Um, he was um, a, a monk, a respected monk. Um, he drove to an intersection in Saigon um, and as a protest to the treatment of the Buddhists, the persecution of the Buddhists under the Catholic dictator Diem, who was an American puppet dictator, uh, he poured kerosene on his body and lit a match and immolated and did not move. You can see the videotape, it's on YouTube actually, uh, did not move through the process. Now, you probably know that burning to death is the most painful way to die, uh, but it was his determination and his practice must have been very very strong and after when they uh, swept the ashes swept through the ashes they found his heart which is pictured on the right um, untouched mm -hmm. and the heart is now in a vault in Saigon the government has it. the Buddhists are trying to get it back <laughs> yeah So after the death of, of great beings, we, they often find relics. And they take many different forms. Some look like bone, some look like tortoise shell. I saw an amazing one in China at Omeishan. Big tortoise shell relic, said to be from a previous Buddha. Um, and some of you may have gone to the relic exhibit here in town see the different shapes that the relics can take. The most extraordinary case I've seen are the relics of a Vietnamese nun named Venerable Dam Lu, uh, who was, she arrived in the States with $26 in her pocket after spending three years in refugee camps in Malaysia and the Philippines. And she arrived in San Jose, where she began collecting garbage and selling it to build a temple. So if you go to San Jose, you can see Duke Vien Temple. It's now very big. And when she died, they cremated her body at 2,000 degrees for eight hours. And when they pulled it out, pulled it out from the oven, they found thousands of beautiful relics in pastel colors, light green, light blue, light yellow, uh, pink, 
like this. You can see them if you go to San Jose. And so that was quite, an, and I mean, people knew she was special, but whoa, they were still amazed to see the relics. So the relics typically seen as a sign of enlightenment? Or a sign of great attainment. I mean, verifying enlightenment, how can we know? But obviously she was a great practitioner. Yeah. So they say death is the opportunity of a lifetime. <laughs> um, first of all, we gain insight into impermanence. I learned that very much with the snake bite. You know, here I've been meditating on death and impermanence for years and years. It, it, it meant nothing compared to actually facing death. I mean, for three months, from day to day, I did not know if I would be alive tomorrow. And that gives you a totally different perspective on it. So, death into uh, insight into impermanence. Second, insight into suffering. <laughs> now, we may be so fortunate as to go quietly into the night, but <laughs> um, it's also possible that we would have some debilitating illness that could linger and we will have to deal with it. Eh? Well, luckily, their palliative care is quite highly advanced. Um, and the Buddhists don't have anything against medications for pain. Um, in fact, they say now in, in Holland, where um, assisted suicide is uh, legal, that in fact, most of them don't choose to end their lives because of pain. It's far more often a feeling of being a burden to someone or of feeling that their lives are meaningless or something like that. So the Buddhists would say, well, that shows that we should give more compassionate care to the dying and, and help uh, you know, senior citizens know that they're loved and, and care for them, right? And then fewer people might choose to end their lives. But in any case, um, third, we can practice patience. Because when we're dying, or when we're very, very sick, all of this applies to when we're sick also, um, things go very slowly, right? So being, you know, being patient, not knowing what's going to happen. So that's a great practice. Because patience, of course, is the antidote to anger. And it's very important that we not die in an angry state of mind. That's the worst. Right? Anger is the worst for the Buddhists. Uh, one moment of anger is said to destroy all our roots of merit. So we want to be very, very careful about getting angry. They say it's related to hatred and even irritation is a low-grade anger. So the antidote is patience. To be patient, patient, patient. Yeah? Okay, fourth is the practice of compassion. <coughs> Similarly to what I described with um, meditation on loving kindness, we can meditate on compassion, which is the wish that all beings be free from suffering. Right? Again, it helps us get over our own um, you know, self-pity and all that. But also, it becomes a very powerful practice of wishing all beings to be free from suffering. It creates enormous merit or spiritual power. Okay, then we can practice momentary awareness, moment to moment. Just be with the moment. Present moment, wonderful moment. <laughs> yes. And we can even achieve enlightenment if we practice really well. Uh, we, through these practices, we can achieve at the time of, as we're dying, or even at the moment of death, or possibly in the intermediate state. Okay. So that, the discussion then turns to medical ethics. We've already talked about a few, such as assisted suicide. But if we talk about death, we have to talk about all the death-related kinds of issues that come up. Um, the bottom line for the Buddhists, of course, is not to take a life, if at all possible. Which, and especially not to take the life of a human being. Okay, so that's the first precept. And Buddhists would even try not to harm animals, even mosquitoes, even cockroaches, yeah? 
So because they say that you cannot kill without anger. You need some oomph, yeah, to get the cockroach. And that is really bad karma. So, um, so the answer to most of these is to avoid killing wherever possible. And the issue of organ donation, I try to raise a little, you know, stir the soup a little bit by saying, well, yes, of course it's good to donate our organs. Um, they have, do they have on the driver's license? Yeah, okay. Um, in Hawaii, we call people who ride motorcycles without a helmet organ donors. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, and that is a greatly compassionate act because it will help someone to live a longer life, right? Now, it gets complicated though because at the last moment of death, we want to keep in a very calm frame of mind, right? So if we're dying, we're going through our process and the doctor comes along and chops out our liver, chops out our eyes, chops out our kidneys, isn't there a danger that we might get upset? And upset, you know, or angry, which would lead to an unfortunate rebirth. So I just raised that issue um, strictly to be sociable, but, you know, uh, to think about it, meaning, in fact, that we need to practice more to ensure that we will be able to practice generosity at the last moment without any attachment to our organs, our eyes, our kidneys, our liver, right? But of course, the other question that's raised is, well, how useful are these organs if the person's already dead? Isn't there a risk that the doctors might be tempted to take the heart while it's still beating? before the person is totally dead. I don't know. Um, yeah. Now, the other issue, of course, that I can't help but raise is the issue of resources. Um, how much it costs for organ, don or organ transplants. And the other issue, of course, is where do the organs come from? In China, now here in the States, it takes, uh, there's a waiting list about two years for a kidney, right? But in China, you can get one in six weeks. Just give a call. How do they do that? So there's evidence that uh, possibly these organs are coming from prisoners especially from Falun Gong prisoners. And that's really disturbing. And it's huge business. Huge. I mean, Korea, from people going from Korea and from other countries to China uh, to get organ transplants. So, and of course, nobody knows where these organs come from. There's really no way of tracking it. They've just been able to uh, build evidence through the reports of uh, people who have been released from jails, Falun Gong prisoners who were released, report having been tested, have being blood tested. Those who were not Falun Gong practitioners were not blood tested. So on that basis, they're assuming something may be going on. Uh, what about um, stem cell research? Good idea, bad idea? Well, from a Buddhist point of view, obviously there'd be no harm in adult stem cell research because no life needs to be taken. They can just take the tissue from the skin or some other organ, right? And then they can use that for testing for, you know, to find a cure for diabetes or heart disease or cancer or whatnot. No problem there. The problem comes with embryonic stem cell research, where they would have to take the life of an embryo. And for the Buddhist, life begins, well, maybe at conception, traditionally at conception. But the Dalai Lama says that if they could prove that the 
embryo or the fertilized ovum is not viable until it embeds in the wall of the uterus, which sometimes does not occur for up to four days, then something like a morning after pill would be okay. So he's willing to, he wants to know about the science and before, but traditionally it's been conception. So, okay, so in, in any case, an embryo has gone beyond that. And so to take the life of an embryo would not be advisable. On the other hand, in the IVF clinics, the in vitro fertilization clinics, they keep um, many embryos, hundreds and thousands of embryos, in case it doesn't work the first time. They freeze them and then they usually implant about eight of them and then they eliminate the ones that are not the healthiest. So already something's going on there. And that's why we see multiple births these days. You know, six, eight is not uncommon. Um, but then what happens to all of those extra embryos in the freezer? Well, they keep them for about five years, but after that, they go in the dumpster. So, if they're going to go in the dumpster anyway, a case could be made that it's worthwhile to use them for clinical testing to try to find a cure for some of these um, terrible illnesses going around. Mm -hmm. So, that's just some ideas about medical ethics. So, well now these days there are lots and lots of books about death and dying. Some of you have probably read Living and Dying in um, Tibetan Buddhism and you know there are lots of um, lots of different ones. I eventually did my dissertation on death and dying um, because I couldn't find another topic <laughs> and um, finally this was the right topic. We'd done a six-week study program on living and dying in Buddhist cultures, and as I was editing the videotape, I thought, oh, light bulb, that's the right topic to do for a dissertation, and then I edited it into a book. So um, my videotapes were not that great, but, <laughs> but the book is, might be useful. And then there are many others. This is just a, a sampling. So... If you're interested in learning more about um, death in, from a Buddhist perspective, then you could read more. So you might have lots of questions. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes. Can you share what you've heard about the stages of death? Oh, okay. Well, that would probably require a longer time um, because it's it's quite. I mean, to do we could do a whole retreat on it sometime. Yeah, and that would be a good idea. Um, and we could meditate through the stages too. I mean, all of this we should try meditating on to really get a full experience of what it's like. But for example. It, when you feel the elements of the body dissolving, first you feel the earth element dissolving. So the body starts to feel very heavy, right? And then you feel the, the water element dissolving. And you feel your tongue become dry, right? And then you feel the fire element dissolving. And you feel your body turning cold. And you know, these kinds of things. And then there are also sort of um, vision, visionary experience that you see at these different stages. And so that these are sort of clues that you're moving through the different stages of the process. And then after the five aggregates, and it's all correlated, the five aggregates are correlated with the, you know, the visionary experience and the elements. And then after that, the 60 mind states dissolve, or 80, I think, yeah, 80, 80 mind states dissolve. 
one by one. And you just learn to meditate through it. Um, and then also you learn not to be afraid of any sort of apparitions that might come into your mind. Sometimes some scary figures. You know, our minds are really, uh, we got all kinds of experience in our minds from past lives, you know. And even, you know, scary movies that we see. Like people go to watch action, what they call action films. But there's some really scary stuff in them. And, you know, garbage in, garbage out. We should really be careful what we put in our minds. All that, you know, the, the kids now, average young boy in the United States, six hours of kill, 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 kill more, kill faster. You know, that is conditioning the mind. So I think that's important too, to recognize how important it is to take care of the mind. We're pretty good about taking care of our bodies these days in Southern California, right? Drinking all that yucky green stuff and taking all those vitamins and stuff. Jogging up and down, but what about the mind? Mind is the most important thing, right? And we've got 24 hours in the day. And But what do we do with them? See, most of, we waste so much of that time. So, I mean, the, the Tibetan Buddhists are fanatics. They don't waste a second. I swear, I, I lived over there for 15 <coughs> years. And I mean, they just don't play around. You know, monks and nuns don't go to, not supposed to go to movies, not listen to music. You're supposed to like get, get on with it. Because you don't know when that truck's going to hit, you know? you got to be ready. So they, they're really young. I remember when my teacher was invited to Seattle, University of Washington, and he'd look out the window and he'd see the joggers going up and down, and he would shake his head and go, what a waste of a precious human rebirth. <laughs> you know, it, so it's totally counterculture. Yeah? But something to think about. How do we use our time? Huh. What, yes? Uh, I know that Tibetan traditions seem to have laid out uh, <coughs> stages and these um, very clear conceptual stages, you know, step by step. I'm wondering if um, Chan and Zen traditions have, have this laid out um, quite no, in fact, they believe that you take rebirth immediately after death. Or not rebirth, reconception. <coughs> you got to take conception first before you get born, right? Okay, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in the Theravada tradition, though there are a few passages in the early texts that allude to something between, but generally in the Theravada tradition, like Southeast Asia, Sri Lanka, they believe that we take rebirth. Re Re-existence immediately, next <coughs> moment after death. And in the Zen tradition also. But in the Zen tradition, you have this interesting phenomenon where great Zen masters are able to predict their dying. So I say, ah, oh, today's a good day to die. Boop. Or a year from now, I'm going to check out. And they do, on the day. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, other than that, I mean, in the Zen tradition, of course, um, it's all about preparing for moment to moment for whatever comes. So. Did you have something more? No? Anybody? Yes? Uh, where was uh, the Mahamudra in the tradition? Mm -hmm. Is that the tradition? Mm -hmm. Mahamudra, the, the great gesture. <coughs> Um, Maha Mudra. Um, it's a practice of staying completely in the moment, all pervasive awareness, moment to moment. Well, that's really great training, you see. It comes out of the Tibetan tradition. Yes. Like yes, yes. Though it, it traces to India. Everything in Tibet traces to India, uh, according to the Tibetans. Now, I would say that. Maybe the shape of some of the offerings on the altar 
probably have indigenous influence. And also the concern with death, I think, has some indigenous <coughs> influence. Because before Buddhism came to Tibet, 8th to 10th, 8th centuries, yeah, uh, there was a Bun religion. And in the Bun religion, they were very concerned about death. They talked about 24 souls, and they were very much focused on that. So I think maybe that influenced when, when Buddhism came in. They especially wanted to know what Buddhism had to say about death. And so that's why it became such a huge topic in the Tibetan tradition. And they came up with some of these practices, such as Poa. But Mahamudra, okay, came from India originally, and then was practiced, first rather privately, rather secretly. But now it's given openly. But basically it is all pervasive awareness, being in the present moment. You see, this is our mistake, is that we space out. This life is so short and so precious, and yet the moments are flying by and we're not paying attention. So, you know, a year goes by, a week goes, they even celebrate TGIF. <laughs> Another week gone, they celebrate in this culture, yeah? Isn't there a, a restaurant named TGIM? Right? And then they celebrate the birthday. Happy birthday to What's happy? You're another year older. Another year closer to death. But very foolish, yeah? And yet, what, ha what did you do that, that year? What did we do today? Well, you did the right thing. You come to the Dharma talk. That's good. <laughs> well done, well done. <laughs> okay, so well, that's the, according to the Buddhists. Okay, now it's up to each person to make their own decisions, right? But in this system, every, precious, every moment is precious. Getting a human rebirth is really special. They talk about the difficulty of achieving a, a human rebirth. It's much easier to get reborn as an animal. If you compare the numbers of animals on this planet alone to the number <coughs> of humans, the number of humans is infinitesimally small compared to animals, especially ocean animals. Much easier to get an animal rebirth. So, so they would say that we really have to start paying attention. We don't know what we're going to get next, right? And so we've got to, what they call create merit, but it means create wholesome actions, engage in wholesome actions. Give a dollar to a beggar, you know, with a good mind, a happy mind, with respect. Creates good karma. Simple enough, right? Or take a few minutes to share kind words with somebody who's not happy. Or so many things we can do. And so that means, that's why this training in, in Mahamudra or moment-to-moment -moment awareness is so important. <coughs> and living fully in the moment. They say that, okay, they talk about how difficult it is to get a precious human rebirth. They give an analogy of the tortoise, the blind tortoise. You know the story? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how difficult it is for the blind tortoise to get his, his or her neck up through the wooden yoke floating on the great ocean in the middle of a huge storm. That's our chances of getting the precious human rebirth. Practically no. So to for our oh it's in our own best interest then to do as many wholesome deeds as we can and make the maximum of this precious opportunity, human opportunity. Now we have our wits about it, you see. Um, we have uh, enough happiness to know that we like it, enough suffering to know we don't like it, and the intelligence to understand what will bring happiness and what will avoid suffering. So that's very special. And, and when we as we develop wisdom, we learn better how to make better decisions and how to use our time more wisely. Yeah? So win-win. We're happier. Everybody around us is happier. Happy, happy. Yeah? Perfect.
Okay, so we can make some merit by dedicating the merit of our evening. You want to dedicate merit? Okay. <coughs> So first we rejoice in our good deed of coming to the Dharma Center and listening to the teachings, listening to the teachings, reflecting on the teachings, practicing the teachings. Huh? And then we rejoice and feel really happy that we did a good thing. And then we want to share this merit with all sentient beings throughout time and space. By the virtue of the merit that I have accumulated, may I achieve the state of perfect awakening as soon as possible in order to liberate all living beings from suffering, leaving not one behind. 